What are some of the things that you would advise people to keep in mind uh, when reading about Ukraine, when reading about Palestine, when reading about China? Any major insights or things that you know frequently get distorted or ignored? Look to the history. It doesn't mean to say that you have to uh, become immediately a history student all over again. Uh, just look to the recent past. Start reading then don't take um, don't don't take as read what you're being told. That's very important. Uh, take take what is being said and take it back and look at it in the context of history. Finding out about Ukraine. What's the history of Ukraine? Where did it come from? Um, uh, it was part of the Soviet Union, a key part of the Soviet Union. Uh, what is this about Ukraine divided into two countries, one Russian speaking? Uh, I mean, that is, is not difficult to find out, but I think people who seriously want to understand the news and see, should see the news only as a facade, then look behind it, look at the history. And what is the role of a committed journalist, because you and I, we obviously have commitments, ideologies. How do you balance that with reporting? What is, what is the, the, is there like a formula? Um, well, you, you, you don't lie. Right. <laughs> you tell the truth. You tell no the truth what, what you're everyone, doing. Everyone has a, has their own view. Right. And what you find out, uh, as the more I traveled in what was then called the third world, I realized very quickly how the world was run, how it was ordered, and who was in charge of power, and who were the receivers of this power and the victims of this power. And that helped form my own politics, as it were. There's no question about that. Uh, so just the very the nature of the journalism I was doing uh, informed, informed the politics, but uh, I don't like the word suspended. But I suppose it is suspended. You can suspend that if you're if you're stating something objectively. You find out something that you're almost certain is true. You can't be absolutely certain it is true. So perhaps you have to qualify it, but. Uh, it, it that is as close to objectivity as you can be. Uh, it's not as say the BBC like to teach its its people that it's a kind of nirvana that you rise to and then you see the light and that there is there is the impartiality. I go towards that light and I'll only broadcast impartiality. That's absolute nonsense because most of what they do anyway is biased. Uh, but dressed up, it's in this Orwellian nonsense about it being Im impartial. But it is, if not, there's no such thing as impartiality, but you can be objective. And that really depends on yourself, uh, whether you want to be or whether, you, you know, the moment you're not, you become a propagandist. So what's the difference between um, impartial and objective? Well, impartial, I suppose, is that you're, you're not impartial. If you're asked right. about the Middle East, you'll, you'll give your view. What's right. your view? And you'll give your view or based on your knowledge. Uh, if I'm asked the same question, I will go. So I'm not impartial. I can't be impartial. Uh, I can't lie about it and say, well, as a matter of fact, yes, no, I know the Middle East and Israel has every right to uh, right. Uh, be in the occupied Defend territory. Itself, as they say. All of right. that. You know, uh, it's an absurdity. There isn't. Uh, but the two are often confused. To be objective about something that may concern, whether it's, um, let's say, uh, the the background to a Hamas attack on Israel, you have to tell what Hamas did. 
But at the same time, here again, because that's an area that has been so starved of facts, you have to, it's your responsibility to supply the background, the, the recent history, uh, and to cut through as much of the, the bigotry as possible. Right. Um, I think it's something that, I think serious journalists who don't see themselves as opinionated, so much, so much journalism is opinion. I was looking at The Guardian the other day, for which I used to write. Um, well, let's say even up to 10, 15 years ago, a news story on the front would say what happened. There might be lots of opinion pieces inside commenting on it. But now it tells you how to think from the first sentence. Uh, and I think that is true of all the major newspapers proclaiming their, their divine impartiality. Um, they're not. Um, and it's, uh, uh, it, it's that empty uh, opinion, opinion that is simply voicing bigotry that is the essence of propaganda. Mm, yeah, and the most dangerous kind is the is the kind that pretends to not have yes. any uh, partiality or any ideology behind it. They're just calling strikes and balls. Yeah, yes. That's when you but really have to be careful. In front of you. You know, you may, may not like what you've seen. Uh, right. Offend you uh, or offend your your allegiances, let's say. But what I'm saying is you have to, if you're as a reporter, and I've been a reporter a lot of my life, you have to say what it is. Mm. Um, you can give the context, right? but up front, you've got to say what it is. Right. Another way, of course, that a, a bias is uh, communicated is to who you're speaking to. So you in your film, The War You Don't See, you ask someone how who they speak to on behalf of the Palestinians. And yeah. there's no, you know, there's no Palestinian equivalent of the spokesperson for the Israeli yeah. government who they seek out, um, yeah. Yeah. Which, which you yeah. point out. I remember that was a, a TV news editor. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I think she was at the yeah. BBC. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think it was the BBC. A rather worried woman yeah. who was interviewing. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, well, that was a very rare interview. Yeah, I couldn't believe that. And everyone has to watch this also. The war uh, you don't see because I can't believe that these people sat down with you to talk to you. Did they yeah. not know who you are? I mean, I guess you're. Yes. Oh yes, thank you're you. You're so respected that I guess yeah. I mean that they they're excited to talk to you. I was just, I didn't know how they would put themselves in that position. You weren't unfair. It wasn't gotcha moments, but you just presented reality to them and they tried to deny it a bunch of times. Well, I think that was the end of a period which you could still, with a lot of hard work, get people from the official world, let's call it that, the corporate world, to come and answer questions to be challenged um, it may they they may be very good at that and they may walk away from the interview and and not told you anything yeah. um, but now uh, the film I made after that which was on the privatization of the health service in oh, yeah. the UK, that was a great one uh, I didn't get a single official and I had to use something I don't like doing because it's kind of, it sort of recognizes a failure in a sense. I had to do all the people I'd asked to be interviewed and all the people who said no. Oh, right. Yeah. Ignored me. So it used to be called the empty chair ch syndrome. And once uh, corporate PR, they were quite slow in understanding. I understood that if they just didn't turn up, right, uh, they made life very, very difficult for you because you had no other side. Um, 
and um, it's um, but now it's I find it almost impossible to get anyone to talk to me from either in the, it used to be I used to get people to talk to me in the Pentagon and in the State Department and uh, um, there was once once during one interview in the State Department where uh, um, one of the press uh, people came in and I was interviewing uh, who was I interviewing I think that's right Marilyn Albright's uh, mouthpiece Jamie Rubin and uh, he walked into the room and he's he mouthed not you and he was the only one who recognized me. right that's and so my, funny. my producer my producer of course then spent the next half an hour virtually holding him down on the floor so that he didn't say anything well right I mean it's abusing to us but it it also marked the end I can't get an interview in Washington now 